I want to honor a specific group of people in the house today. And uh, my message is not only for you, but I'm hoping that it'll be greatly encouraging to you especially. Um, definitely gonna be speaking to everybody in the house today, but I wanna honor our life group leaders. If you're a life group leader, why don't you just raise your hand right now. Can we give these incredible people a hand? <clears throat> you know, leading work um, in a group that is, that is about performing a particular task is, is, is often done way easier than life group leadership. I just need you to know that. Like doing a task is very tangible. Like I know when it was done, I know when it wasn't done. I know what to do to fix it when it wasn't done. I know who to speak to to fix it when it wasn't done. Life group leadership is not like that. Sometimes you don't really know when you started to lead a person. Like you're trying to get people to move along their journey of faith and um, you're not certain, you know, are they even responding to your attempts to help them to grow? It's sometimes so vague and so you don't even, you're not always certain that you're being successful and whether you're doing it right. And so I just wanna applaud you for sticking to your guns in this amazing thing we call discipleship because it's not easy to lead people in things that are intangible, some things like spiritual growth, like, when do I really know that you're growing spiritually? I'm hoping that you are. I'm trusting that you are. And I mean, we do have certain things to help us to see, you know, that there is some progress. Or, but so often, life group leaders feel that, I don't know if I'm getting this right. I want to say to you, thank you. Thank you for journeying with people. Thank you for loving people. Thank you for long suffering with people that you are guiding. And essentially, including in your journey as you follow Jesus, um, and so, <clears throat> as vague and as intangible it is, it's probably one of the most important things that Jesus left to the church to do. 10 days ago, we celebrated Ascension Day. Back in the day when the church was founded, at the Ascension of Christ, he gave them a set of instructions. And the most clear call and mandate for the church was that we should all go and make disciples. All of us should go and preach the gospel and include people in our journey of faith and help ask them to follow us as we're following Jesus. So, I mean, and this, is, this is one of those glanced over things often because we're very used to when nobody gets the, when, when everybody gets the job, often, you know, everybody thinks that somebody will do it, but nobody ends up doing it. And, and I think today's message is a call to all of us to just, to just pay attention to this again and ask ourselves the question, am I following Jesus in what he left for the church to do? This very not intangible task but for those of you who have already started and sometimes feel just a little worn out, remember it's progress over perfection. Remember what is your job and what isn't your job, right? And, uh, and, and remember the joy your father has when you follow him in copying his son, in seeking and saving those who are lost and helping those who are found to grow in to maturity in Christ. God is incredibly proud of you and incredibly glad about you um, in South Africa, we have this song that we wrote as a, as a student ministry, um, and it's essentially that, that God spins around with incredible emotional joy when he thinks about you. Um, I don't know about how many of you guys, uh, you, have, you have traditional dances. What do y'all call it when, when the people dance like this? The jitter, the jitterbugging, yeah? All right, so that's the closest like, cultural reference. I God jitterbugs when he thinks of you. <laughs> Because it's just so appreciative when people step out and trying to model Christ, trying to, 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 to emulate Christ and then model Christ to other people. But uh, for those of you sitting here and think like, oh man, I can, I can never do that. I wanna, I wanna ask you today to just bear with me because God thinks more about you than what you're currently thinking about yourself. When Jesus said, look, I need y'all to go make disciples, he actually also gave you everything you're gonna need to be able to do that. And you looking down on yourself like that is not what God desires for you. In fact, he would rather you look at yourself accurately and be bold enough to say, yeah, I should be able to do this. 
um, and not think that you're being proudful or arrogant, but just that you're thinking correctly about yourself, then you going, oh, you know what, I could never do that, trying to be fake humble. And so we all need God's help to do this, to change our perspective, to change our mindset so that we can step into this call that he made, that he gave for the church. So let us today position our hearts towards scripture in such a fashion that it is able to transform us, okay? So here's what the Bible says, that the traditions of man are often more powerful than scripture because it keeps you stuck in the way that you think about yourself or that you think about your, you know, your, 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 your culture around you. But we are not to conform to the culture around us, amen, right? We are to allow the scripture to teach us something different about who we are so that we can step up to the plate of what God has, expects of us to do. So please get on your feet and make a declaration with me. I believe as we make this declaration, we're positioning our hearts towards scripture to receive from it what it needs what, what we need today to become what God has for us in this. So is it up there? You can shoot the declaration on the, on the thing. Yeah, there we go. Y'all just follow me as I, as I count. One, two, three. This is the word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Therefore, I declare boldly. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I've been forgiven and set free. I have mountain moving faith. The Holy Spirit empowers me to be a witness. My heart is receptive and my mind is alert. I'm ready to receive from the incorruptible, imperishable, everlasting word of God. Today's word will accomplish all that is sent out to do in me and I will never be the same. Holy Spirit, come and transform us. Show us from your word, God, the things that you have designed in us and enabled us through your word and your spirit that we might step into those things in practice and think and op, um, uh, consider ourselves according to your word and your view, not our own. I pray that in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. So today is Pentecost Sunday, right? And so I'm gonna, we're going to look at the, in the book of Acts, which is the record of Pentecost, what happened and, and, and the, the, the conditions surrounding Pentecost that I believe are really important. And we're going to make some applications for us today. So let me ask you this question, though. Would you agree that at the ascension of Christ, Jesus gave instructions to his disciples so that they would receive the best that he had to offer for them for their mission? Would you agree with that? Yes. He told them to go and do something because he wanted them to be set up the best way. How many of you want to set up your kids for success? How many of you are working hard to give them the best start that you possibly can give them? God has that same desire. He tried to set this group of people that he called his church, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a minute, to set them up in the best way possible so that they would be successful in the task that he would lay at their feet. So I have another question. How can we receive the best of what the church has to offer for us today? And I believe this also to be true. How can we receive the best that OSC has to offer? You see, when you were motivated to come to OSC, there was, a, um, there was ideas in your mind about it. There were things that people told you. There were, there were, there were you know, uh, concepts that you've heard people you know, speak about or, or, you, or you just read about. And, 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 and all of those things created this, this idea, maybe it's a good idea to go there. You knew somebody from there. And you thought that, man, this is somebody that is worth spending time with. This is a, a decent person or a solid person. Maybe I should go and see what their church is all about. What you actually experienced is you experienced the culture of OSC by, via the testimony of other people, the witness accounts of other people or your own account of encountering somebody from this place. And all of that is really important because 
those testimonies and things come about because of a specific reason. Those people had those experiences here because of the way things are done here. And, 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 and that, those things we call our values. They're very dear to us and they keep our identity on what scripture wants the church to identify as. And, and, and they help us, our praxis, to emulate that what we believe so that people's experience would be the love of Christ, the compassion of Christ, the care of Christ, the truth of Christ, the direction of Christ, and the excitement, joy, and all the things that goes with that, right? And so we would try to preserve that. And, 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 but, but that's something that, that we must understand, that it was not just, okay, this is a good idea. It came about as a result of some things that were, that were living inside of this organism that made the motivation a reality for you. And, and, and I think that what I wanna say about that is that for you to experience that truly, there's some conditions. It's like, if you want to have the same testimony as the people that, that shared with you had about what God is doing here in, in, in this church, then you have to follow the same route and do the same things and participate in the same way to be able to experience that because they did not get there and that experience purely by doing whatever they wanted to do. They were, they were a part of the house. They experienced the, the blessing of the relational connectivity and the, and, the, and the direction that the house offers. And so I'm laying a bit of a foundation here today to talk about this relational environment. But let's first look at what happened when Jesus said to his disciples to go into the world and to preach the gospel. He said something really important. You can join me in Luke 24, or you can follow on the screen. And so in verse 46, Jesus lays the charge to, uh, to them of what they are to do after his ascension. He says to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for, uh, for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Do we have people that are from different nation heritages in this house, right? All nations. It's great that we can be in the same place, but back in the day, they had to go a little further than just their immediate environment to reach all the nations. Thank God, because otherwise we wouldn't be here, right? Um, to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And then he says this, you are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you but stay in the city until you are clothed with power. The Gospel of Luke is the only one that includes this, this charge that Jesus said to them. Look, first go to the city of Jerusalem. Stay there until you are clothed with power on, from on high. And so Jesus tells the church, look, y'all, it's up to you to take this message of Jesus having died for our sins and that we need to repent of our trying to work ourselves into salvation and put our trust in Christ to receive the grace to be able to receive salvation, you need to preach this message to the end, until the ends of the earth, starting in Jerusalem. But before you get going, I need you all to go and gather in Jerusalem and wait until something happens. And so we see them going exactly and doing that. They just had this supernatural experience. How many of you would like to like call your mom and say, you will believe what just happened? I saw Jesus go up in heaven and right in front of my eyes and Jesus says to them, hold on, first go back to Jerusalem. I need to clothe you guys with power before you go out. And so they go. Acts 1, we pick up the story, verse 12. They return to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, about a Sabbath day journey away. Remember, they weren't allowed to walk a lot on the Sabbath, so it must have been close. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Interesting point. They didn't go to a gathering of all the believers, every conceivable person that at that point had started believing in Jesus. Neither did they go to the temple. No, they went to a house. They went to their house. And there was a room in the house in the, uh, in the second level or something where they gathered. And then it calls out who gathered there. Um, and it says, and all these, verse 14, with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. When the Bible mentions something, it's not just by happenstance. He, it mentions it because it matters. Women were included in this meeting. They weren't separate. 
they weren't any longer considered as less than and unable to lead in the church environment. They were included with all the leaders in that group of people that Jesus said, I'm going to do something significant with y'all that'll, that'll start something beautiful. Um, and I also like to refer, always, always like to mention this, that even Jesus' brothers were there. So if you're gonna convince somebody that you're the savior of the world, the most difficult one's gonna be your, 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 your next brother. Would you agree? <laughs> it's like, yo, you need to worship me. What's up? <laughs> Bye, Felicia, I'm out. <laughs> that ain't happening. <laughs> and yet here we see <laughs> Jesus somehow and everything that had happened had convinced even his brothers. I mean, that would be the most difficult person to convince that you have to bow your knee to, right? Even his brothers were there. Okay, that was just a side note. But this is the start of the church, y'all. Think about that. This is the start of the church. The church didn't start with music and stages. It just started with people. But there were some conditions around these people that were important. First thing is they were there, they were gathered together. There was unity among them. They were unified in prayer. They were there in obedience to what Jesus said for his purpose to be lived out, to be enacted by this group. And then later on, we see that they were also devoted to the teachings of the apostles. And so it's, if you look at these conditions, you start seeing that church isn't just merely gathering. There, there, there is something more to this thing called church that Jesus defined, and, and we do best to accept his definition of it instead of trying to redefine it according to what we think is better. But essentially, this was like the first life group. They were there, it was a small group of people, it wasn't all the believers together. They were meeting at a house, it wasn't at an official church building or the temple or anything. It was like a life group. And I think of it as the first life group. And, and their assignment was, listen, y'all, you're going to take what is here, the conditions around this, and you're gonna try and multiply this from city to city, from region to region, across the whole world. And we see that happening. If you read through scripture, you read of the church in this city and the church of that city that made it this leader's house or made it that woman's house. And, 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 and that's how the church started. It started with a people gathering for the purpose that Jesus charged them with, making disciples in unity, prayer, and committed to the teaching that the, that the disciples and the apostles were, were sharing with them. And that is essentially what the church is still doing today. This expression of church, even though it's very, very, very uh, um, um, popular in the Western world, is really not that popular in the rest of the world. And by the way, the Western world isn't the biggest part of the world. There are more people in the world that are not, quote unquote, Western than there are who are. This expression of church is actually, you know, a bit of a, it's the most public one and it's the most advertised one, but it's also the, 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 not the most prolific one. The biggest churches in the world don't meet like this. It's just true. The church has always been not necessarily stage, music, lights, preaching like this. The church has always been rather groups of people coming together and meeting certain conditions and being involved, being involved, being involved in the mission, being involved in the mission. In verse 24 to 26, it reveals real important aspect of what I believe needs to be in place for a church to be church that Jesus defines as church. And it's interesting to note that it's only after this happens that Acts 2 commences with Pentecost. In verse 24, it says, they prayed and said, you, Lord, know the hearts of all. Show us which one of the two people that were nominated to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the Lord fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. 
There was something about the number 11 that just wasn't right. Now, I know because culture explains some of these things. The number 12 in Hebrew culture was the number for governance. And so they felt the need for the 12th apostle to be restored for the governance of the church to be in place. Unless that 12th person was put in place, it was deemed that the leadership of the church was inadequate and not rightly set in place. We see from this an emphasis, not just on the headship of Jesus, but also on the necessity of human governance in the church. And anybody that, 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 that disregards human governance simply isn't following the pattern of scripture laid down in that early church's beginning. Human leadership is important to God. That's why he lays so much emphasis on what qualifies you to be a human leader. What is the, uh, what is the, you know, the, the, the weight that is on human leadership? Because it's important. If he defines it, it means he wants it done in a certain way. But this was important, and, and I believe that, that once this, leader was, this leadership structure of the church was in place, it was now in the right condition to be empowered and sent. So let me talk about Jesus' definition. I've been saying what Jesus defines this thing as. What does Jesus call the church? He called it his ecclesia. The word ecclesia now has lots of religious connotations, but back in Jesus' day, this word was borrowed from Greek culture and Roman governance. Government, it was, it was, it was a governmental function. So here's what the word ecclesia meant outside of religious circles, okay? So before the church existed and before this was almost co-opted by Jesus, this is what it meant. It simply meant it's a gathering of summoned people with the purpose of making decisions on the agenda of the council. It was a governmental term. It was a group of people that were called together. Y'all, we need to decide how we're gonna do this that needs to be done. And everybody would come and they would weigh in on how we're supposed to do this and the roles will be defined and people will be said, you have this response, you have this response, I'll do this, I'll do that. Hey, what about this? Shouldn't we do it this way? Shouldn't we do it that way? That was what the ecclesia was. It wasn't a gathering of people where a couple of people were doing the work and the rest were observers. No, Jesus' definition was that everybody was participants in the making of decisions and the carrying out of responsibility. That's why Jesus introduced a completely new concept because up until that time, their religious lives had a particular structure, what Jesus would call a wineskin, right? And Jesus explicitly said, look, y'all, what, what I'm trying to bring in, the kingdom of God and how to live in the kingdom of God is the new wine that does not fit. It, does not, it cannot be contained by this old structure. It'll break and it'll be wasted. So much of what Jesus has said there is happening in the church globally because so much of the church has gone back to the old wineskin where it's only the clergy, it's only the priests and the pastors and the, 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 you know, the select few who is doing the mission, doing the work, and the rest are observers. That's not what Jesus intended. That's never what he, that's why he used the word outside of the religious mind frame set perspective so that they would know this is different, y'all. This is something new. And therefore, it has to look and operate different. It's no longer just the priest that's going to go in and do sacrifices. No, every single one of us are going to be priests that worship in the presence of God. It's no longer going to be one person that's a prophet. No, all of us should learn to prophesy, to encourage one another with words of wisdom, knowledge, and, 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 and prophetic insight. Can y'all see the difference between the, 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 the old structure and the new structure? Why Jesus didn't say, hey, y'all, let's start our temple worship. Because that would have put them in the mindset that, okay, you're gonna do all the reading and all this and we're gonna be amen, 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 and we're gonna go and do nothing about this. Because that's what was used, how it was used to be done. 
We'll just bring you our offerings and you go and you do the work of our sacrificing. You know, see how much we've, we've fallen back into that old system of thinking. Jesus says, I want to pour out new wine, the kingdom of God, and it'll only fit in something that is actually closer to an ecclesia, where everybody's chiming in. Everybody's like, okay, I'll do this, I'll do that. Hey, can we do it this way? Hey, what about this? This will be really effective. Oh, yeah, cool, you go do that. Everybody was in on it and making decisions and running with the responsibility of this new mission. You see why this involved leadership, structures, role division, but everybody carrying some of the load. And let's remember that what was the load at that time? The load at that time wasn't singing music, stages, and lights. It was just sharing the gospel, serving people, and making disciples. Sometimes I hear people say, I love Jesus, but not the church. Remember, Jesus waited until the leadership was put in place and the church was ready with the right conditions before he empowered them and said to him, right, this I need you to duplicate. This I need you to multiply. People don't wanna accept Jesus' definition of the church. And when things don't go perfectly right in church, which it wouldn't because we're human, People make excuses for not having to be a part of an ecclesia. They find it more comfortable to be in the old way of thinking and doing things. But God is saying, don't let mistakes and hurts keep you from entering into the best that the church has to give. You, if you say, I love Jesus, but not the church, man, that's, that's offensive to God. Look, look, if you come to me and you tell me, look, I like you, but Esther, she's just dodge, man. You think I'm gonna appreciate that? You think I'm gonna like you? I'm sorry, I ain't that holy. I might punch you. I don't know. Don't speak about my wife like that. How can we assume we can speak to God's wife like that, y'all? Church is his wife. Now, I know you men with the, you know, I'm a wife. <laughs> just, just, just forget about what that minute for a minute. Just, you're the body of Christ and, and, and we are the bride of Christ. People think that Jesus is gonna be impressed with them when they say, oh, I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. No, Jesus is gonna, come over here. Let me tell you something. You know what, it's also, it's actually somewhat self-depreciating. We are the church. Who speaks to themselves about like that? Unhealthy people speaks to themselves like that. If you underappreciate you or depreciate you, you're, something's wrong. It's not right to do that. God wants you to speak about you the way he speaks about you. You're my beloved. You are redeemed. You are set free. You're forgiven. You're blameless. You're righteous. So let's speak about the church like that. And I know there's matters of justice and sometimes there is injustice and they need to be dealt with, but the way to deal with them is not to divorce the church. The way to deal with them is to engage deeper in relationship. Every time an offense is covered, every time an offense is sorted out, love explodes. And that's what he wants. That's what he wants. Some people say, oh, that's true. You know, I don't need the church to go to heaven. And that's true, but it's completely missing the point. Because the mission is not heaven. The mission is the expansion of his kingdom on earth and including everybody that aren't in it, in it. And you need the church to do that, to walk under the lordship of Jesus Christ. You need relationships. So you do need the church. And sometimes people say, yeah, but I am the church. We are the church. When we're gathering our Christian friends, we are the church. Yes, he is present, that's true, but the rest of it's not true because the church has leadership. The church has designated leadership, acknowledged leadership, and that is important to God. You can't swipe it, whitewash that out of the way. And so forming this 
little group on the side that, that isn't done because of a clear direction from the Holy Spirit to start something uniquely different that has a purpose for why it needs to be different and can be acknowledged by other people that, look, this is of God and be sent to do something. There's just too much rebellion in the body of Christ that is, that is not healthy. And it doesn't help the mission of the church. And so I know that some of this is preaching to the choir, but I also know that some of y'all deal with you know, friends and family who have gotten hurt in the church and instead of engaging and sorting out, they've just divorced and just, you know, now they're the biggest critics of the church. Let us not fall into that trap and let us carefully, compassionately help people to see the error of doing that. If you need to be in a different space, then go to a different church. But don't become critical of God's wife because every finger you point points three back. We are all under judgment. We are all guilty of making mistakes. And goodness, if God can look over our mistakes, then hopefully we can look over one another's mistakes as well. And we can come together, rebuild, reestablish friendship and relationship and start building again for a better future now that we've learned a ton. Every time we make a mistake, we learn and we get better. Become better, don't better. Let's be better. Um, Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. Jesus isn't building anything other than his ecclesia. And if you want Jesus' wind in your sails, build an ecclesia, not something else. I think that's also why he encourages um, us who are a part of a church movement in Hebrews 13, 17, to obey the leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. It's not just, okay, submit to every little thing they say. No, they have, they're accountable. They're responsible before God for what they teach and what and how they lead. And, and, and that weight puts the fear of the Lord on us. And, and, and helps us to stay in line with his will and his way. And wise leaders always have structures of accountability, and this church has them too. And if anything happens in this church that is unbiblical, there are people that will be able to step in and correct that, because we are also under authority. And happily so, happily so. It's only people who want to rebel who hates authority. People who want to want to live in, in, in good stead, in good standing and love and compassion, they have no problem submitting under authority. You see that in your own house with your kids. So it says, let them do this with joy and not groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. For you to receive the best that the church has to offer. You know, it's, it's, it's gotta be something where you come to a place and say, okay, good, I trust the leadership and I will follow. And when they make mistakes, I'm part of the ecclesia. I can come to the council and say, hey, what about this? I don't agree with this. I don't think I like this. Let's talk through it. Let me tell you, we have the greatest respect for people who wanna talk things out. Absolutely, absolutely. Come, let's have that conversation. We see you as the ecclesia. See us also as that. And let's work it out. Let's make it happen. That's how we get the best out of this church that we can possibly get out of it. So after the leadership was put in place, the day of Pentecost arrives. It says they were all together in one place, again, at the life group, not in the big group. And I say that specifically because I wanna lay a foundation about how important life groups are, but I also wanna make sure that we understand that life groups are not some fringe group that has now decided to do things their own way. It's still a group that's aligned with the vision, the value, and the mission and the theology of the church, yeah? All right, so first thing that happened at this life group, after these conditions were met, the Holy Spirit comes in power. Interesting, the Holy Spirit didn't come in power in the big meeting, in the big group where everybody was. No, Jesus waited till they were gathered in a small group, and there the Holy Spirit, let me tell you all, 
Don't keep the Holy Spirit out of life groups, y'all. Don't keep him out there. Just embrace the fact that the Holy Spirit wants to break into life groups. He wants to empower people, and I'll talk about that more. But let's read Acts 2.1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were there together in one place, and suddenly there came a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And then divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. <clears throat> and then we see amazing things starting to happen. Um, all of a sudden, people start gathering around this thing, right? Life groups are attractive. People need relationship. But when people come to a life group, I hope they encounter the Holy Spirit and not us. People are attracted to it because the Holy Spirit is in it. We must not then go and say, oh, no, no, let's not let the Holy Spirit do his work in the life group. Let's wait for the big meeting. No, 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 no. Let it be. Let it go. Let him do what he needs to do. Because if we do that, the life group becomes an incredible thing. It activates missional lifestyles. The church was actually launched out of this life group. Life groups are so activating to the life of a Christian. Um, you see in Acts 2, verse 6 to 8, I'm not, I won't read all of that, but essentially what happens is people start coming and what they hear is they hear the gospel being preached by all of these people, men, women, the whole works. And they were telling them of the goodness of God in their own languages. God wants to reach the nations, y'all. There was a reason why God enabled those people to speak in different languages because he needed the early church to know this was not just a Jewish thing. This was meant for all peoples. All peoples. And let me say this, that there are people in our cities that are not from our country. The gospel is meant for them. I made a little coup about them earlier, but let me tell you, there's a reason why there is such an attraction on the United States because this is still a place where people can hear the gospel freely. Let's not miss our opportunity to share the gospel with the people that are coming. Since they're here, let's give them the truth. Let's love them. Let's care for them like, like we would. Baba says, those who, who entertained strangers unknowingly sometimes entertain angels. There are people amongst people that will get saved and they'll go back to their countries eventually and they'll lead revivals. You can never know what happens when you reach a person from another town, another region, another state, another nation. Put politics aside and deal with the person you see. Don't blame him for what's happening. Love him. And share the truth with them. And there's something so amazing about life groups to include people, to bring people in. And I'm gonna say something about that because when we start reaching out to people, we'll encounter things that we as individuals are not able to fulfill. But as a group of people together, we might be able to make an impact. But Lifeway Research did, a, did, a, did, a, did a, a study and they found that the benefit of people living regularly in small Bible study groups are so tangible. They said people who go to life groups regularly understand the Bible better, they feel closer to God, they understand relationship with God better, they trust God more, and they make better life decisions. So don't tell me it's not worth the effort to arrange your life around these types of relational gatherings. But let's look at what happened at the life group to further expound on the importance of this. I've seen so often people cool off spiritually if they disconnect relationally. And here's the, here's the, 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 the tragedy of big churches. People are attending, but they're not connected relationally. And you can cool off while sitting in these seats every Sunday 
and just slowly be cooling off in your fervor to serve God's kingdom and to make disciples. Relational connection fires up our practical, our, our Christian practice. Here's what happens to these people when, in this life group. Verse 42, as they were multiplying these groups and places, the Bible says of them that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers, and day by day attending in the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They encouraged one another to keep gathering we gather in different contexts, different cultural contexts. We don't shut down life at noon and have a prayer hour like many cultures do. Our lives don't include that, but we have to make space for it during our week. That's why we have these life groups. So that we understand that it's not just about the Sunday. There's every day of the week where we need to start connecting with people relationally. Christianity is an everyday faith. And by being part of a life group, these people stayed Christ-centered. Christ was in every single day. We have to find a way while we're walking with people in relationship. How can we encourage one another? How can we share our faith with one another? How can we check in with one another on a regular basis so that we will have that reminder that every day is Christ's day, not just Sundays. The second thing that happens, they started sharing resources. The Bible says that they all had everything in common. Those who had a lot shared with those who had little. And nobody had need. You know how that happens? That happens when people start knowing each other. And they start trusting that, hey, you're not going to abuse my charity. People's hearts open up to people that they trust. That they see are legitimately going through a hard time. But then they can start walking that journey to understand why are you in this hard time. And let's make sure those things don't reoccur so that you can get a hand up, not just a hand out all the time. Yeah. But those things happen best in relationships, in life groups. The third thing was, so, so they stayed provided for. The third thing, encourage believers, unbelievers to faith in God. V verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with people, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They stayed fruitful because they gathered in life groups. And lastly, they encouraged learning about God. Acts 5.42 says, every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, that the Christ is Jesus. They stayed hungry for more of God and for mission because they kept gathering house to house and in the temple. The more you learn about God, the more you experience about God, the more you will want others to know God. And life groups are just such an incredible catalyst for this type of lifestyle. I'll end off by sharing a quick story and then I'll be done. <clears throat> My life changed in a life group. Um, I started going to this life group as a student and I didn't, know the, I didn't know which church the life group was a part of, but I knew the person that invited me. And I had respect for him because he was a, he was a um, um, outspoken, you know, mature student Christian leader in our, in our, in our, on our campus. And so I went because I knew him, that's all. I didn't know what the group was about. I didn't know which church they were part of. I went. Man, it was just so incredible. They taught things of scripture that I had not encountered before, that I had not known before. And I grew up in a, in a real, like, you know, theologically centered, very traditional, staunch kind of church, went through catechism and everything. And yet they had, an, they had something different. They knew God. Their theology was good, but they had something extra. They had a relationship with Jesus. And I, I, I had heard of that and I'd kind of like dabbled into it for a little bit, but I never really understood much of it. They prayed for people in the life group. People would you know, get baptized in the Holy Spirit in the life group. And I was just like, whoa, what's all this about? And they would say, sit with me. 
Come see, here in the Bible, this is where it says, this is what we're doing. We're just doing it here like what they did in the early church, that's all. Took me to the Bible, took me to the Bible. I started saying, yeah, I can see that. Why is this now not happening where I'm from? It's the Bible. So I started going. Five weeks into this, first time they mentioned the church. Five weeks into it, the first time they mentioned their church. It was not about the church. It was about Jesus, about Scripture. I met Jesus in those life groups. I met the Holy Spirit in those life groups. Yet they were not aligned with the church. And I heard of it because they invited everybody to a worship night. And you know what happened when I heard which church they were from? I was like, hold up, soul up. This ain't good. I said, I said, y'all know that church is a cult, right? And so I'm speaking to all members of that church. And they were like, really now? <laughs> we're all in this church. <laughs> and I'm like, seriously? And they were all like, mm, 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 mm. And I just thought the one person that was trying to invite us all there, you know, was like, I was like, hey, y'all, let me, let me, let me just protect you from this person. Like, and I was like, oh my goodness, I've experienced so many good things of this life group. And here I understand that this is completely aligned with this church and they're teaching what this church is teaching. And what am I to do about this? Conflicted. I said to myself, well, the only thing I can do is go to this church and help these poor people in this life group by, by figuring out every single theological thing in this church that's wrong so that I can come and help them get out. So I went, true story, so I went. Only to find myself in the front crying and just like being touched by the Holy Spirit, having heard Him speak to me about my, my future in ways that I never heard Him before. And I was ruined. It was like nothing made sense anymore, except I knew suddenly what it meant to have an experience of the relationship with God. And that started me off on my journey to discover my calling. All I knew is that people needed to experience what I experienced there. And I started sharing my experience with people. And I started getting people saying, hey, y'all need to come, y'all need to come here. Where did I bring them to the church? No, life group. Y'all need to come to life group. So our life group grew, like grew. Shortly after that, they said, hey, would you like to be a life group leader? I'm like, yeah, sign me up. I can tell more people about this and help more people experience this, absolutely. Within seven weeks, my life group was 90 people. Life group. It's a small church. But it was just, God started things out of that life group for me. And I believe God wants to activate things in your life. And if you're struggling to get activated, you need to get into a life group, man. So with that, I would like to just pray for us today because... Here shortly in the new like semester or that, there will be a big life group launch and you will all be invited to start making a decision which life group you'll be joining. But let me say this. I know that some of your like schedules are a challenge. It's every bit of effort worth to rearrange your schedule to make space for this relational gathering with a small group of people. It's worth every dollar you spend to get your kids to be cared for while you go and, 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 and engage with lifestyle Christianity with this group of people. It's worth every single dollar and every single phone call you have to make to make those things happen. It's worth it. Try to figure out now how can you incorporate this into your lifestyle because it's worth it. It's so, so worth it. Let's stand and let me pray for you. If you're thinking, man, I can't do this discipleship thing. 
You know, I'm just a, and then you bring definition. Just realize whatever definition you're gonna bring there, that's not Jesus' definition of you. Everybody can meet with somebody around a Bible and a coffee and just discuss how do we make this real in our lives. You and another person is a small group. That's a life group. That's where you start. Holy Spirit, I pray that revelation will hit people right now of how possible it is to make disciples and how small group can help activate that. Lord, I pray for people in this place to make decisions today that when those things come around again, that they will join up. They will start their journeys in learning how to make disciples, learning how to grow spiritually with other people, conversation around scripture, around your purpose, around your mission, and how that makes us grow and become more like you. Every question, every objection, I pray, God, that you will gently just remove that out of their hearts and show them that it's possible. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.